Aha, and here we are. Love quits rising like the phoenix from the ashes of the COVID-19 pandemic. Quarantine day one. Actually, not really a quarantine, but it sounds a little more dramatic. But being Friday, I thought we should all take a moment to indulge in science and nature on my very first ever... Is this a podcast? Um, or is this a Snapgram? Or is it none of these? And feeling a little bit weird talking to myself, I invited two friends to come participate in today's Science and Nature. Mr. Seal and Mr. Teddy Bear. They are my total audience, but I'm going to pretend as if my class is here. So, um, all right, Science for Nature. Let's start with, ooh, let's start with nature, actually. I think nature was sort of cool in this week. All right, here we go. This one sort of, I have to admit, this one made me laugh out loud. Um, so probably as you did when you were a child, you may have caught moths um, at night every now and then, and some of them appeared to be fuzzy. So someone had this crazy idea, what if fuzzy moths, the fuzz is actually to help camouflage them from echolocation in bats. So this is sort of, um, well, science at its weirdest. Uh, someone went and actually plucked all the little hairs off of a moth or shaved them and then put them out there with bats and guess what the bats could find them right away so yes a fuzzy moth has echolocation camouflage you heard it here first in nature all right for all you new yorkers out there this is this is great has there been selective pressure on rats that live in new york city as we all know new york city has jokingly been famous for the rats for a long time so a group of scientists from from new york captured New York rats, sequenced their entire genomes, did a whole population, a whole cohort, and then compared it to progenitor rats um, from China, which is where the rat originally um, came from. And uh, what they found is that there's been an amplification of alleles in genes that control diet behavior, behavior and mobility in New York City rats. So they are well adapted to their environment. Perhaps not too surprising. All right, ooh, 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 here we go, here we go. Um, Hot off the press, I guess it's not settled. So I thought that the pangolin was the absolutely settled upon origin of the COVID-19 virus. Turns out it's not. There's still some debate out there. And there's several groups that are arguing actually it came from bats. And um, the closest coronavirus relative still seems to be in the bat. And the original group that said it's 99% identical to this pang pangolin coronavirus only did a partial sequence. And when you do the entire sequence, it doesn't really match up. So stay tuned, still being debated, but um, it could be back to the bats. So, but still stay away from red foxes. You may remember they have the largest reservoir as far as we know. All right, who would have thought? I didn't think um, that we are the only primates that have an arched foot. I didn't know that actually. And uh, so it's been thought that the reason we are bipedal partially is because of the arch and it gives us some sort of stiffness that enables us to jump and run in ways that I guess we couldn't if we had flat feet. Anyway, so they, someone actually looked at the test of that idea and looking at the stiffness of the tissues in there and looked at a sort of structure function relationship and found that, and I will read this, the underlying principle resembles a floppy currency that stiffens considerably when it curls transversely. Yes, that made it very clear for me too. All right, here we go. Never thought about this. Lifespan and health span are not the same thing. So lifespan is just that, how long an, an, a population lives on average. Health span is how long the individuals of that population are healthy. And I hadn't realized this, but I guess we've been increasing lifespan pretty much consistently globally with a couple of ticks up and down here and there but health span has not changed very much. So we live longer, but we get unhealthy at the same point that we did in for previous generations. That's sort of a scary thought. Um, they now know, or they just discovered, at least in C. elegans, the mechanism, and presumably because we have the same genes, that'll be a similar mechanism in us. So as we get older, and ready for it, comes back to chromatin, there are two genes which are involved in remodeling, actually, no, I take that back, sorry. There are 59 genes that are involved in re modeling histones, and specifically those that control metabolism. And they do it in such a way that mitochondrial function decreases as you age, hence that's your health span moment, um, even if you increase lifespan. And that explains why in the third quarter, I'm really slow at everything I do. I'm gonna blame it on the epigenetics mitochondrial factors. 
and entropy, of course. Okay, here we go. We still have a moon, thank God. Turns out, um, I don't know if you could call this a new moon, but Earth's gravity has roped in an asteroid that's pretty big, like it's the size, of, it's, the, it's like a mini moon, it's the size of a car, so a mini, mini, mini moon, and it's now circulating the Earth um, in orbit, like a giant bowling ball looking for satellites, sort of. Okay, um, who would have thought, but amphibians, turns out pretty much all of them, uh, which suggests that it evolved very early, if you hit them with the right wef wavelength of light, actually fluoresce in the dark. Coincidence, or is there an evolutionary advantage? Unknown, but they're really pretty when you shine UV on them. Knowing now that flying squirrels appear pink to each other, I suspect <laughs> that salamanders may also have a way to see each other. Um, who knows? Last year, wind power topped power production let me say that, I didn't say it accurately. Last year, wind power surpassed hydroelectricity in power output for the first time in the history of the US. And there we go. Oh, all right. For those of you that like science fiction, this may, this may be sort of interesting. So there's this idea that uh, if a satellite goes up and it's sort of, the two satellites collide, it'll make lots and lots of space junk that'll be flying around the, um, the circulating the earth at really high speeds and it'll be like little millions of little BBs and because satellites are really fragile those BBs will then hit other satellites and cause them to shatter and then we'll have just this cloud of debris um, uh, going around the planet and it will prevent um, any satellites from ever being able to go in space again. And this is actually a real concern like like scientists spend a lot of time calculating when this will happen how do we prevent this from happening and so on. Well so someone has now made a very small satellite that will go up there and pick up space junk. All right, there you go. A Swiffer for the atmosphere. Or maybe not in the atmosphere, a Swiffer for the, is that the troposphere? All right, this one's very, very timely. There's a nice review article in here on neutrophils. So neutrophils are a key component of your immune system. They do many, many things. They're sort of the first line of defense. But one of the things they do is when they overreact is they create a tremendous amount of inflammation and tissue damage. And so they are one of the, um, culprits or causative agents actually of viral sepsis and so there are a ton of drugs that are either in, that just came out of phase two clinical trials for trying to help neutrophils do their thing but not overdo their thing so there's one that's been coming out of clinical uh, phase three clinical trials for um, do, 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 for uh, vasculitis disease there's another one for COPD there's one for um, uh, cardiovascular disease, for asthma, cystic fibrosis, and for hypertension, all of which are partially exacerbated by neutrophils. So our best friends, when they do their job right, a little problematic when they get a little excited. Ooh, ooh, here we go, here we go. When I was a child, I fell in love with peanut butter. And I have ever since, you know, I have a couple comfort foods. I like salty, greasy nitrates, sausages, pepperoni, stuff like that, bacon. Um, and then I just like peanut butter and honey. I do. When I feel bad about myself, I just eat peanut butter and honey. So peanut butter, peanuts actually, as you guys know, are a large source of, um, of allergies. And the question is mechanistically, how is it that people become sensitized to peanuts? Is there a connection to your gut? Dun, dun, dun. So antibodies are primarily produced in bone marrow, but it turns out, or in your, um, actually, I should, let me walk that back. It's actually only IgE that's produced in bone marrow. But it turns out, as of this week, IgE, which is a type of antibody, can also be produced in your gut. So what they think the mechanism is, is that when you eat um, whatever it is you eat at, at early in life, you know, and you start making antibodies against those foods, or ideally don't make antibodies against those foods, but at some low frequency, you do make an antibody against something you ate as opposed to a bacteria that you don't want or a virus or a protozoa or something like cholera. And you end up with that little beastie right there that then gives you a peanut allergy. Hmm. Oh, 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 here we go. Here we go. Who would have thought? So I've mentioned a couple times, and we haven't gotten around to it, but we will before the semester's over, these things called long-coding 
long non-coding RNAs. So these are really, really large RNAs that as far as we can tell, don't do anything. And it turns out if you look at the five prime UTRs, very often there are like little mini open reading frames in there that, that if um, the ribosome happened to translate, they'd maybe make a three to 10 amino acid polypeptide. So it's always thought that, you know, those things really don't get translated. So when someone asked just a very simple question. Do all of these RNAs that don't seem to be translated, do they make potentially lots and lots and lots of small proteins? And the answer is yes. So they found um, at least 400, and these are tiny, like tiny, tiny proteins that are actually, they look like just like little junk open reading frames that are, that are like in the five prime UTR or in this long non-coding RNA. And uh, when they knocked them out using CRISPR-Cas9 to see if there's a phenotype, it messed up development. And what organism were they working in? They were working in, I wanna say it was like fruit flies or something like that. One of the great model organisms, which I'm spacing on the name of. We'll go with fruit flies. Okay. Oh yeah, oh yeah. What else do we have here? Uh... Oh, we'll end on that one. Okay, here we go. Dogs, great sense of smell. So someone asked a very simple question. Uh, pathogens, many, may release volatiles, potentially. And would it be possible to train a dog to smell an infection before it could be detected in other ways? So this is actually in trees. So there is there's a bacterial pathogen that will actually kill a citrus tree. Um, and you usually can't see the pathogen on the tree until about three months. And then the, the current treatment is you just cut the tree down and you get it out of your orchard before it kills all the other orange trees. So using dogs, they found that a dog could detect the pathogen um, two months earlier than you could actually see it, which enables people to get the trees out of there before, they spread to, before the disease spreads. And so one dog was about 90% accurate in detecting the pathogen. If you had two dogs, they were 100% accurate every time. So by just having two of your furry friends running around your citrus orchard, they can tell you which trees you need to cull before everyone gets sick. Not bad, huh? Not bad. Okay, that's all I have from the bat cave wearing my SMC purple nights. Um, day one. And I'm gonna make another video when I know how to do this even better. And, uh, and when I seal and the teddy bear stops staring at me with creepy faces. Okay, hang in there. Remember, rise like the phoenix from the ashes during times of crisis. Let crisis bring out the best in you, not the worst. See you shortly. Bye.